event. So welcome. First of all, thank you already now to the panelists that you had time and uh, join us. I'm really looking forward to this event. Uh, we are going to talk about the power of virtual communities for real life change and especially how digital technologies can help us reach SDG 3.5 and promote well-being. And uh, just to explain a little bit why we are having this event, why we are here. So the, the main theme of the Commission on Social Development this year is socially just transition towards sustainable development the role of digital technologies on social development and well-being of all. And that's why uh, we, I, I wanted to look a little bit on what then the social development actually means and uh, what, what would alcohol's role be in it. Uh, and so then we, if we just look at it, so social development actually means improving well-being of every individual in society so they reach their full potential. And this is, I know that there are many civil society organizations in this call uh, or in this event that are working exactly with this. Movendi International has been, uh, has been working with um, creating environments and conditions for young people so they can, for all people, that they can live up to their full potential since the very beginning, since the start of the organization, which was in 1851. So actually for 170 years. Uh, I, I have joined the organization as a young person, uh, as a teenager, with exactly this idea. I didn't know back then that it was called social development, but I just felt that uh, there is uh, people carry lots of potential with them and they do not get the chance to really realize it. And I already then wanted to contribute to creating these possibilities for people that they can do it. And now here we have here the a commission for Social Development that I learned a little bit later about uh, that there is actually uh, governments agreed on certain actions that uh, to take to enable uh, people reach their full potential. Um, and that also means investing into people and it also means removing barriers uh, that, that are blocking this uh, development or reach of the full potential. And that's what we are going to talk about today. Uh, we are going to talk about substances with a big focus on alcohol, but not only. Uh, and all we are going to do it also because uh, when it comes to alcohol and the harm related to alcohol, it's uh, acknowledged, of course, in the health area, but within the social development and social and sustainable development, we are talking very little about alcohol's role and we would really like to bring this conversation into the space of social development. So that's why we are here today with this great panel, as I have already said. Uh, so we have uh, here with us Maristela Montero from PAHO. Uh, then we have Elizabeth Matfeld from UNODC. Uh, then we will also have Richard Piper from Alcohol Change UK and Adrian Jenga from Nakada in Kenya. So these will be our speakers this day. We have also promised Holly Whitaker, uh, who couldn't join us in the last minute. She had uh, something, so she couldn't attend this event. Uh, but we will touch a little bit upon also uh, what she was supposed to talk about. So without further ado, I would actually give the floor to Maristela, uh, to, uh, who is then the senior advisor on alcohol and substance abuse in the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health in Pan American Health Organization, PAHO. And I will stop sharing. Welcome, Maristela. We are really glad that you are here with us. And I will uh, give you the space and opportunity to share your screen <laughs> and take Thank us through. Uh, is there still one minute? Yeah, one minute. Right, everybody can see that. Yes, oh, we can see it. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for this invitation. It is an honor to be here and uh, to share some ideas on uh, 
innovation technologies. Uh, most of my presentation actually is going to be around that uh, and on the burden of alcohol and the impact and the, uh, the commitments that have been done globally around alcohol to give a, a, a frame for this discussion. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, since 2010, WHO has a global strategy to reduce harmful use of alcohol that was adopted by all member states and uh, guides the work of the organization in this direction. One year later, we, we uh, had the WHO NCD, or non communicable diseases framework, that uh, integrated alcohol among other risk factors and uh, chronic diseases. And alcohol is listed that uh, as a target with at least 10% 10, 10 reduction by 2025 in the harmful use of alcohol. And then came the SDGs and the agenda of uh, the SDGs 2030 and uh, with 17 goals, as uh, you all know, many targets. And in 3.5, alcohol is separated from uh, other drugs and is the only substance that it has its own targets like that and uh, measured by uh, the national uh, alcohol per annual, alcohol per capita consumption among those with 15 years of age or, uh, or older. And this is the uh, indicator that uh, is reported every year by WHO and uh, it is uh, developed in consultation with member states and their uh, approval. And to change uh, per capita consumption, you need a conjunction of strategies that I'll briefly uh, talk about. Alcohol is related to uh, many uh, conditions, not only health conditions, but it affects the social, environmental, and uh, economic development of uh, nations. And it's related to 14 other SDGs. It relates to loss of uh, jobs, unemployment, increased health expenditure. Uh, it affects uh, pregnancy and uh, fetus and uh, children's outcome. Uh, it is a major risk factor for TB, for HIV, for uh, the major NCDs, mental health, road injuries, and other fatalities and is related to domestic abuse, uh, partner violence, and uh, children's uh, violence. And, uh, and also relates to the parental roles uh, that we want to promote as healthy roles. And uh, in terms of even related to water and sanitation, as uh, the work of uh, Movendi even uh, has come up with uh, estimates that uh, many liters of clean water are needed uh, to produce beer or even wine and spirits, all types of alcohol produce uh, need uh, hundreds of liters of clean water to produce just a liter of uh, the corresponding beverage. And uh, uh, therefore many companies are trying to buy water resources from countries in exchange of small developments, but then to sell the water and to sell the alcohol later on. Uh, the costs of alcohol to societies are massive and way above what countries receiving revenues from selling alcohol. And uh, it alters the, uh, in, uh, it affects neighborhoods, communities, uh, the public space, uh, adolescent health, etc. So we have, uh, from the WHO perspective, uh, uh, the dimension of the problem has been uh, well uh, described uh, with global burden of disease studies, WHO reports, PAHO reports as well. We have reviews of the uh, 
international literature on what works to reduce the consumption and the harms associated with alcohol in several uh, publications. And uh, we have the documents, as you've seen, uh, uh, international commitments that have been made uh, to decrease the harms from alcohol. And finally, we also have uh, proposed actions that countries need to take. And uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about that in relation to alcohol. So we have a conjunction of uh, information and still are lacking behind on implementation, on the political commitment to take alcohol seriously as a public health priority uh, as it is. The reports, we have uh, global reports that have been done for many years uh, in WHO, and uh, we have been uh, in PAHO uh, releasing uh, regional reports based on uh, more or less the same information, but more uh, focus on regional analysis. And I'm just gonna give you a brief flavor of some of that information, why alcohol is so in, uh, such a problem. In terms of per capita consumption, which is the SDG 3.52, uh, globally, as you see in, uh, in purple, is uh, there has not been much change in the world in terms of per capita consumption. It is stable and uh, relatively high. And uh, in the Americas, uh, we are about 40% above the global uh, rates and also not moving. And we see in, in the uh, Southeast uh, Asia and West Pacific increasing trends in, in uh, per capita consumption, but we see also in the European region that these trends are decreasing. It's the only region that is uh, decreasing significantly uh, per capita consumption. In the Americas here is uh, a, a brief overview, you can see country by country, the changes between 2010 when the global strategy was approved and 2017 when the latest data that we have. And you see almost half of the countries have increased, another half have decreased and the overall change regionally was very minimal. And for, uh, have episodic drinking define uh, prevalence defined as drinking five or more uh, standard drinks per occasion at least once a month uh, the same uh, trend happens some countries have decreased some other countries have increased substantially and it's the average is stable at uh, more or less 25 percent and this is a percent of heavy episodic drinking among the whole population, not only among drinkers. If you just select the drinkers, actually, it, that goes uh, for men, for example, over 50% uh, of men drink uh, that in, in that way, in that pattern of drinking, which is very harmful uh, to uh, health. And about 25% of women do so always men drink more than women and in higher amounts. And here for alcohol use disorders, including alcohol dependence, we uh, are second to uh, the European region where the consumption is the highest. Uh, we follow with the second uh, highest prevalence in the general population of alcohol uh, use disorders, including dependence and harmful use. Uh, but I put the arrow there because for women, this is the highest prevalence in the world. It, it, as you can see, comparing all uh, regions among women, uh, we actually have higher rates than any other region, which is very worrisome and represent uh, years of drinking uh, that by women that we know from other surveys, there are increasing adolescent girls uh, starting to drink earlier and matching boys uh, very soon in going to heavy drinking. So what are the solutions and uh, all the reviews of the literature and uh, what is known the best buys uh, in the NCD global uh, framework. There are three 
most cost-effective interventions in low and middle-income countries that can decrease uh, the impact of alcohol. And they relate all of them to a restriction in the availability of alcohol uh, through taxes uh, and price measures that uh, you reduce the affordability of alcohol and uh, uh, enforcing bans or prohibiting alcohol advertising, uh, sponsorship, promotions, you reduce the social uh, desirability, let's say, of alcohol. And, uh, and uh, access through availability and that can be hours of sales, sales to minors, places where alcohol can be sold, the uh, density of outlets are all uh, uh, policies related to the alcohol availability. And these are the three areas considered as the most cost effective uh, in low and middle income countries. And they, the evidence also comes from hundreds literally of studies in developed countries too. So WHO two years ago launched uh, uh, an initiative that has the acronym SAFER that is, ba is based still in the global strategy, but focus on what countries can do to make a change that is meaningful, feasible, and uh, within uh, uh, a smaller time frame, so, so to say. And they are based on the best buys, so they include taxation, uh, prohibition of marketing and limits on availability. And two others there are very good. They are not considered the best buys because that is a frame for the whole population, but they are very effective. One is on uh, 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 drink driving countermeasures. Uh, that uh, we know uh, work and will reduce uh, road injuries and deaths. And the other is on facilitating the access to screening, brief interventions and connections to treatment services uh, that if scaled up to uh, a significant number of services, particularly in primary care, you can have a population impact as well. So the SAFER uh, uh, initiative uh, for countries, it means to implement these five areas, at least to monitor what's happening uh, through surveillance, evaluation, and continuous uh, uh, monitoring of the situation at country level, and to protect policies from conflicts of interest and from the interference of the alcohol industry because it is important uh, to safeguard these measures. The SAFER is based on public health and there is an inherent conflict with the commercial uh, interests of those who sell alcohol and uh, advertise alcohol, etc. And of course, in, uh, part of the protection is to use the scientific evidence and be transparent in the uh, uh, in the way these policies are developed at country level. In terms of health services, it's important, and just a brief note that uh, usually they are focused traditionally in treatment of alcohol dependence of the most severe cases and putting people uh, in inpatient treatment settings, sometimes for a long time, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. What we need to focus is on a health promotion approach, on identifying those who are at risk or are drinking at levels they are not that they're not yet dependent or severely dependent at least on alcohol. So they can uh, make uh, choices and uh, know their risks and uh, consider uh, be motivated to reduce that consumption. Uh, is not treatment of alcohol dependence. It doesn't replace treatment, but uh, it has a prevention uh, side to it in health promotion that is very necessary. That's the focus of uh, health services that uh, we promote. Now, a little bit about COVID because it impacted everyone's life on earth, I would say, and many changes happened 
uh, related and unrelated to alcohol, as we, you know. And uh, with COVID, many of the uh, public, uh, the opportunities to drink alcohol in public have been shut down bars, restaurants, uh, uh, festivities, uh, sports events, cultural events, uh, a lot of that has completely stopped or reduced uh, significantly. But people who drink then would drink where? They would uh, then basically go to drink at home. So it became private what was before public. So we would expect uh, at least that some of the harms uh, that happen in public, like road injuries, or some of the violence in bars and restaurants would, would decrease. And uh, we don't have yet a, a full account of what happened in 2020. Uh, but excessive drinking in particular at home can put women and children at risk and uh, it can increase injuries at home. And uh, domestic violence has been reported to have increased. And uh, because of the isolation or, or the, the situation that everybody uh, was uh, and was affected by mental health, uh, in their mental health, uh, alcohol was used or could be used to cope with those uh, distress, um, uh, that everybody was going through, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, and even suicidal thoughts. Uh, some, uh, the drinking could have uh, worsened uh, NCDs. We know they uh, worsen NCDs, cause NCDs. So all this needs to be accounted for the balance. What, what happened uh, last year and is probably likely to happen, uh, continue to, to happen. Uh, still. And uh, kids and everybody became uh, hooked to online uh, everything, learning, uh, entertainment, and connections, and they have the good side, but it, particularly for kids and adolescents, the exposure to alcohol advertising and promotions have probably increase exponentially. The same uh, for women being targeted, happy hours online, drinking to cope with uh, having kids at home, working from home, etc. cetera. Uh, we uh, did some considerable work on uh, educating the public uh, on the misinformation, the infodemia that uh, spread related to COVID itself, but especially also uh, alcohol and COVID, because all types of uh, 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 myths spread that alcohol could protect against the virus, that if you drink, you would not be killed by the virus, or you could kill the virus and or uh, have higher immunity. And none of that is, uh, is uh, true. And the alcohol industry, we know, also benefited from uh, many corporate social responsibility um, activities in which they could promote consumption. So this is uh, uh, the core now of uh, the, my final say is what then uh, innovation technologies can do in this context. And uh, I think the use of social media to reach out to civil society to galvanize the support for alcohol policy uh, is still to be tapped. It has increased a lot for many areas of care and we can do the same for alcohol and, and drug policy. Artificial intelligence uh, can uh, be used and developed to uh, have machines that look like humans and can provide screening and brief interventions that have always been uh, difficult to implement in health services. They take more time. They uh, need a neutral uh, professional to not judge or, uh, or the patient not feel that he's being judged or she is being judged by a professional. And this can be done uh, with artificial intelligence. WHO just released one uh, on tobacco. It's called Florence and it, can, it exists in various languages and uh, we are trying to develop one for alcohol as well. 
Mobile applications can, uh, can be developed to improve health literacy, to have a one stop of reliable information that people could get on, on alcohol instead of uh, just Googling uh, what they want to know. But they need to be uh, done with the uh, best available evidence and by uh, reliable uh, organizations. The capacity building, the training activities can be done uh, via mobile applications and several has been, have been develop, uh, developed and, continue, and you can also train uh, policy advisors, uh, advocates have on hand easily answers to common questions re, uh, posed by parliamentarians, et cetera. Telemedicine for uh, many services uh, began to develop and they are much needed for alcohol, for alcohol use disorders, connecting people. That connection for people with dependence is very important and uh, needs to be galvanized so they don't fall into depression or uh, relapse and they can continue on their abstinence goals. Uh, you can talk about electronic records. There is also developing digital mechanisms to connect services in countries uh, of all types. And, uh, and not only in mental health or alcohol, but between alcohol and physical health, mental health, uh, and be people-centered. And uh, one that is uh, has been developed before COVID, but it is another example of uh, technology is uh, ing ignition interlocks to prevent drink driving. And I know they're being developed in, in the US. They might be in use already uh, in some states. Uh, I'm not updated to that, but I know uh, they've been tested. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and I'll thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maristela. And uh, just so you know, like there, there has been a little bit of a discussion in the chat uh, where there was an interesting question that I think that we can also then come back in the end. And that is the, the question from Amy. Is the legalization and the regulation of alcohol the reason it's separated from other harmful drugs? And then there were already some answers to that, but not. Uh, I wouldn't say that it has been answered yet. So I think we could uh, come back to it. And then also there is a very important comment in the questions and answers. And uh, it was a comment, but still I think uh, it's important to um, address it because the, the consumption of the of different regions uh, that you have showed the little graph, uh, it shows that the European uh, region is decreasing compared to the other regions. But the comment is that it's important to say that Europe is still above all the others and it's really a huge amount of alcohol that is being cons consumed in Europe. And also what is important to say that the decrease is also caused by certain uh, countries that had huge decrease and the others and in some countries it's even increasing it's the uh, commonwealth of independent states that had introduced some policies and decreased it so i just wanted to uh, so you you know what's going on what was going on while you were presenting thank you very much for this uh, great introduction and uh, i will give the floor now to elizabeth uh, matfeld uh, from unodc uh, she will address a little bit the way how they work with uh, substances in general and increasing uh, awareness uh, through the digital technologies. So the floor is your Elizabeth. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen. I have to uh, make a couple of disclaimers in the beginning. Uh, although we're talking about digital platforms, it's not always my best skill. So <laughs> I will tell you that um, I, I do want to, in the middle of the presentation, uh, switch and show a video. And sometimes that does take just a few minutes to uh, manage that task. So let me uh, jump in first by saying thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, you know, we've been talking back and forth and it's really uh, an honor to be asked to talk about this. And I'd like to uh, thank Mar Maristella for really setting the background, you know, setting the foundation 
because for me in UNODC, we are looking at drugs and crime. And so most people put us into that box that we can't talk about anything else. But you'll see in this presentation that we talk about substance use prevention. And so that cuts across all of the uh, substances, which would include alcohol. And many of you on this, call, on this call are focused in that area. Also, I took the opportunity because I know we have a shorter time to talk about a very specific strategy that we have. But please know that uh, on our website, you can find you know, a plethora of documents, guidance, information around substance use prevention. Um, again, cr cutting across those substances, however we define them, and um, treatment documents as well. So I please uh, encourage you to look at that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we, are, we have as a digital uh, platform or a campaign. I don't usually use the word campaign, and I'll tell you why shortly. But... Um, it, I'm going to talk about three different things today in the presentation. We'll talk about a little bit about dissemination of messaging and how we use technology to really get a message across. And I'll talk a little bit about focusing on a purpose and making sure that we have some uh, connection with science and we're not just talking. And the third thing I want to talk a little bit about is sustainability. So that gives me a lot to talk about in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so let me just start with uh, the Listen First materials. Uh, they, the impetus for the Listen First came from the UNGAS, which if you don't know what that is, it's the UN General Assembly special session on the world drug problem. And I think most people on the call probably are aware of that. It happened in 2016. It was really, a, a, you know, a, about every 10 years that it happens, it brings people together to have that conversation of what, how are we really tackling the problems around the world related to drugs. And prevention has, has always been strong for people like us in the field, but has not always been a strong priority area for member states, as we know, at that policymaking level. And so we made a strong um, outreach with a number of member states. If I remember correctly, it was over 40 uh, member states that said, yes, we support this and we want to see something happen. And so to make it visual, to give it some attention. Um, we even had uh, Queen Sylvia participate in the, in the kickoff. So it was really exciting, but we, had, we created three videos and those three videos were really similar to a public service announcement. Um, our focus was on listening, hence the name Listen First. And we know that, or we chose that because the science is very clear that if parents take that opportunity to listen to children, that that's a, a strong protective factor. And that's one of the first steps in helping you know, move in the direction of substance use prevention. So we wanted to set that really strong foundation and really bring people to, to the point where you don't have to invest billions and billions of dollars. You don't have to you know, have a program that everyone does exactly the same thing. We can start with some basic things. It was very successful. People were excited. Um, as you can see from the slide, we used a, um, a fun purple people, we call them, an animated kind of a uh, group of characters. Now we hesitate to call them family because not because they're not a family, but because everyone has a different sense of what a family is. And so in the videos, you can see the characters coming in and out. Um, you can see, we hope pe the people can see themselves reflected in the characters. Um, so we do have tried to work on a gender balance, all of those kinds of things. So I'll share a little bit of the, the things that go into our thinking as I, as I share about the materials, because I think that's important when talking about this virtual communities. Um, and so the platform was the three videos. Once you see the video, there was no call to action. There was, you know, oh, that's a nice video. And so in the beginning, we got some play, we got some numbers, but you know, once again, if you see the video, maybe you pass it on to a friend, maybe you say, uh, I'm doing some work with a parenting group, that group could use it, great. 
not a lot moved past that. We then really wanted to grow and we grew to the point where we looked at five stakeholder groups. And we knew that policymakers, for example, are not going to look at videos. That's not the way they'll get their information. So we created very colorful, beautiful brochures. All of this you can get on the website. You can see the uh, address there, www.unodc.org slash listen first. They're all there. You can get them, you can download them, they're free. We, deter we thought everyone would print them and pass them out. Surprise, not everyone prints them and passes them out. Again, no call to action. There was just a resource, but unless you're interested, like the people that are on the call tonight, tonight for me, maybe not for everyone else, but the people who have made the commitment to be on this call, you might be interested to do that. But even so, it would probably not be 100% of you. And so we got our partners pretty well aware of it and pretty much using the materials, but it didn't go too far beyond that. Um, as you can see, we have all of the social media keys built in, Facebook, us, Twitter, all of the social media platforms as well. So it's key for me to show to say two things. One, um, on the first slide, you saw that it is linked to uh, SDG 3.5. And so I, I just think that it's important that we say that because we're talking about health behaviors and changing health behaviors, we know, and the science is very clear, does not happen by just telling people things. If it did, we would have no problem with overweight, we would have no problem with smoking, we'd have no problem with alcohol use, because most people, even the children of the youngest age, if you ask them, is smoking okay, they know to answer no. They have that knowledge. It's our behavior that's the challenge. And so, yes, SDG 3.5, but also at the bottom of the screen, you can see our international standards, the link to the international prevention standards. Again, a key document for us because we always want to be able to link to the science. So in our first rounds, in the videos, in the stakeholder group fact sheets, that connection to science was very obvious to us. We knew that we were connected to science and we felt it gave us sense of strength but we, we realized that others did not. So this year we had some funding and we wanted to grow and develop. Obviously we wanna sustain the momentum that you've developed. And COVID really gave us a, a focus. The donor had wanted that idea that now we have children, perhaps in an unsafe situation, spending more time with their parents, <laughs> um, doing their schooling online, all of the things that could put them at greater risk, experiencing something that's never been experienced before in terms of perhaps trauma, uh, trauma not just from physical trauma, but also trauma just from changing routine, not seeing their friends, not being in that ability to learn and grow in the, in the social development way that we might want them to. So we did our, our homework and we looked at, uh, we created what we call the science of care. The science of care means that we created 10 videos, much shorter videos. Each of the videos comes together with a science sheet. And that science sheet has all the references and all of the information because we want to really force people to know that this is based on science. It's not just UNODC thinks it would be a nice idea if you talk to your children, but rather that this is something that is connected and strongly connected to science. And you will see very clearly throughout these materials that there is a connection to COVID. There is a, a the 10 pieces that we picked and the videos that, that you'll see have a connection to being, uh, I don't want to say isolated, but being separated from the normal social in interactions. However, they are not exclusive to COVID. So you will also be able to use them at any other time. If we ever get to go back to spending time together, <laughs> you could use them in in-person situations as well. So you see, we still have our characters. They're very clever. Um, I want to um, just share that today is a very exciting day for us because today was actually the launch of our the Science of Information video. 
I, I don't want to take up too much time, so I'm trying to keep a close eye on my time. Um, but the science of information video is really started out as the science of communication. And then as things changed and developed, and we got more and more input from partners around the world because we focus group every single piece of this, every word, every um, uh, visual gets goes through a focus group process. We, we really moved in the direction of it should be about keeping children safe using technology. So I, I do wanna take two seconds to transition my technology. I'll show you the video, talk about that for a minute, and then I will summarize, Christina, I'm, I promise. <laughs> so let me stop sharing or switch my sharing. And please give me a sign, Christina, if it doesn't work. Okay, great. I will transition back to my presentation, but while I'm doing that, um, let me just say a few words about some of the things that we put into that that we feel very strongly about that were you know, key for us um, in terms of, uh, you notice right away characters and the characters have expression. There's not, there's no words, there's no spoken words. Obviously, that helps us in the UN in the UN sense because it's globally able. People can pick up the message. You notice it's very short. For those of you who do social media and are really using that digital platform to get your message out, the shorter the better because it can be picked up in a social media post and it can be reshared more regularly. It's also picked up because it's short, it's picked up by the press. So we recently for this, um, we put out a press release within two hours, we had 80 uh, outlets in the United States pick up this um, and it grew, you know, it grew higher than that over time. But, you know, that's a significant reach. We were at almost a million um, in terms of reach within just the first two and a half hours because it's short, it's easy, it's concise. You'll notice that we um, have technology. It's uh, the computer. One of the first things that we got feedback on when we used our focus groups was not everyone has a computer, not everyone has a keyboard. Um, and most people are accessing, most young people are accessing their technology via the, tele the telephone. So we, in, into the uh, video you know, goes the, the young boy having the telephone. And so we want to make sure, again, gender sensitive, we use sound, we use pictures, we use the color. Um, the other thing you may notice is we spliced in the pictures of real people. Those are real people. They are not actors. They are not people that um, we uh, hired <laughs> to do this. That is people from around the world that are uh, partners, you know, people we have interacted with, with that have voluntarily sent us video that can be used in, in these videos. So you'll see real images interspliced with the um, characters. And that started to help us have more of a diverse feel. And it brought the message, remember I said sustainability, it brought the message to a place where people could see themselves reflected and they could see what they were doing. So um, uh, just so that I don't, ah, uh, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't go, now it went. <laughs> I'm almost done. I just wanted to share a little bit more about uh, some hints that we've gone through because it has been a couple of years. One is in order to sustain the effort, you really have to keep changing and growing. You have to keep um, putting the effort in. We sustain it through building communities. So we have community, we have the website that is ongoing is changes on a daily basis. We have uh, success stories. So anytime 
in a success story at the community level, at the country level, at the regional level, or at the international level. So as uh, I don't think Christina knows this, but this will be uh, highlighted in our success stories um, that will come out the second or third of March. And it will be on the website before that. Uh, we also are moving in the direction of making it skills-based because we can get this message out to people, but changing people's behavior is, is a more uh, complicated process. And so in our next iteration, we are, being, we are focused on, and we have some very powerful uh, help from the research world, William Crano and a couple of other people to really help us move the message in that skill-based place. And uh, Maristella also spoke a little bit about this, but the idea of health literacy is a really important piece because that's where you have the cross section in some of the most vulnerable parts of the world. So where, where people are, are having a difficult time accessing health in general, this is a nice way to open the conversation. This is a nice way to get information to them. I'll just give one simple uh, ex example. We have been working on an app which will help people refugee settings where they, the, the vaccines, not for COVID, but for regular vaccines, health-related health well baby vaccines are provided to the family. And it's tracked on this app so that the family receives a notification saying, hey, it's time for your child to get their vaccine. And we have an appointment made at this day and time. And so what we will do is incorporate in these small videos, almost as if they're commercials into that app. So at the same time that the family gets that message about their vaccines, they will get some of this other information. Um, and then looking at trying to be flexible. So I leave you so that other people can speak. I leave you with my contact information and happy to share or answer questions as we continue. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And you also managed the techno <laughs> technical part. So that's uh, great. So no, thank you very much for, for also this information. I think now we have a, you know, have a very good, very concrete example of how you've been using and how you also progressed from, from the beginning, from the starting idea and how it developed and adjusting and reflecting on how the world actually reacts uh, to your communication. So this is amazing. And it will be also really great to follow up and then to understand how the people really react now to this uh, after also the media are picking up this information. Uh, I will, uh, we will move now to the next speaker. And I suggest that next one would be Adrian because Adrian is in Kenya and that's even later. I think soon it's midnight for Adrian. So, so we will give the space for you. Uh, please, the floor is your Adrian. If I can do something now, let me know. Otherwise, uh, go ahead. Adrian uh, represents NACADA. It's a, it's a governmental agency and uh, working focused on uh, drug prevention. And the floor is yours, Adrian. Go ahead. Thank you, Christina, and good evening to everyone. Um, I'd also like to take this early opportunity to thank Muvendi for inviting Nakada to be part of this important um, forum. Be it as it may that it's about to be midnight here, we felt that it was important for us to be part of the forum and also to share um, how we utilize digital technologies to advance our mandate as a national authority um, that has been um, tasked with the role of coordinating the campaign against alcohol and drug abuse in Kenya. Um, Christina, you already mentioned what, uh, what we do, so I will not belabor on that. NACADA is um, the national focal point on matters alcohol and drug control in Kenya. Um, and what I will share really will focus on our experiences during the, the COVID-19 pandemic because really for us as government, that is when we particularly adapted um, the use of um, digital technologies um, to enable us to, to, to do our work as government in various sectors, be it education, um, be it in promoting um, healthy living, be it even in matters security. Um, we did adopt a lot of technology so that we can be able to engage communities in, in pursuant of some of these agendas. 
Um, the, the issue of drugs and alcohol in the country affects all our sectors. Um, for us, particularly health, which we've, we've alluded to, um, education, the education sector has also been greatly affected by the, uh, by the challenges associated with substance use. Um, in our country, we also have some challenges around um, food, food security and drug, alcohol and drug use has also been singled out as a risk factor um, for, for, for this particular area and manufacturing and housing. We've also seen a lot of challenges associated with substance use in um, family breakages, um, issues of crime, and even increased incidences of suicide, particularly during the COVID-19 period where um, individuals experience disruption from their normal way of living because of the various interventions that government had to put in place to um, avert the spread of the virus. So for us um, as a country, as a government, we appreciate that in the long run, the negative health effects of drug use inhibit the realization of our development um, agenda. And as a country, we have aspired that by the year 2030, we will have um, attained uh, middle income status. And that means we only have nine years to go. And so far we, we are realizing that alcohol and drug use is emerging as a serious challenge that we need to contend with because of the youthful population in our country. 70% of the population of Kenya is under the, the age of 35 years. And um, as I will share next in the data, um, a number of them have already started to use um, some of these substances. Um, the slide that you're seeing is from a study that we conducted in 2017 on the prevalence of alcohol and drug, drug abuse in the country. And as you can see, alcohol, um, the prevalence rate for alcohol was at 12.2%, meaning that 3.2 Kenyans at the time we conducted the study were, were using alcohol. Um, tobacco was at 8.3%, um, 2.2 million Kenyans were using tobacco. Um, cut, um, this is part of the world, it's known as Mira, 1.1 million were using cut. And for cannabis, um, which is um, also called as marijuana in this part of the world, 1% was, was using uh, marijuana at the time of the study. Injecting drug use was, um, we only had at the time 18,000 18, people who were injecting heroin um, at the time the study was conducted. The, the, the age group um, for this study was between the age of 15 um, to 65 years. We also conducted a study to ascertain the prevalence level of um, employees, both in government and in the private sector. And we realized that uh, public service employees uh, or civil servants are using more alcohol um, than those who are working in the private sector. This has therefore necessitated government to put in place various interventions, which I will share as we continue the presentation um, to avert this problem from, from spreading um, further. Um, still from the same studies, um, we also wanted to ascertain the level of substance use disorders among our population. And as you can see, alcohol use disorders um, ranked highly at 10.4%, meaning that in our country at the time we did the study, we had 2.1 million people who um, are living with an alcohol use disorder. Um, tobacco use disorder ranked at 1.4 million. Um, cut, disorder, cut use disorders were at 645,000. And cannabis use disorders were at 166,452. Um, when you total up the numbers for tobacco, cut, and cannabis, um, it's slightly above 2.3 million, which is just slightly above the alcohol use disorders. Um, which is why as a government, if you notice the, the, the meaning for acronym, it's National Authority for the Campaign Against Alcohol and, and, and Drug Abuse, because we want to emphasize that alcohol is the biggest problem that we have in Kenya. And um, even as we talk about the other drugs, we acknowledge them, but the bigger issue that we are dealing with as a country is actually alcohol. So we are putting um, in place measures to be able to ensure that these people um, with alcohol use disorders are able to access um, support services for treatment, care and reintegration back into the community. Within our schools, we also conducted a study to ascertain the prevalence level within um, um, primary level and, um, and secondary level of education. Within the primary, within the secondary schools, we learned that alcohol was a drug of choice for most of them um, at 3.8%. 3.8% of the students who 
participated in the study were using alcohol at the time of the study. And we were fascinated to find out that prescription drugs was actually the second drug of choice after, after alcohol, um, followed by cut and then, and then tobacco. We did a follow-up study in um, primary schools to also ascertain um, because when we investigated in secondary schools, one of the questions that we were asking them is when did you start to use drugs? And it came out that by the time they were getting to secondary schools, they had already started way earlier in the primary school days. So we had to do a study in the primary school section to ascertain um, I mean the status at the, at the time. And again, alcohol prescription drugs topped the list at 7.2%. This was um, a red flag for us because when you think about alcohol and drug use uh, prevention interventions, we really focus on, on prescription drugs. So prescription drugs top the list, followed by tobacco and alcohol. Part of the reason why this may be the case was because primary school students um, go back home in the evening. So if they consume alcohol, it would be very easy for parents to detect that they were consuming at the time when um, they were in school. And because they want to hide and not to get caught, they were looking for something that they can, they can use um, that will not necessarily get them caught. For tobacco, um, the types of tobacco that they are using is smokeless tobacco, not your ordinary cigarette, but nicotine pouches. Um, yeah, most of them are using nicotine pouches because it's, 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 it's um, odorless and parents and teachers are not able to detect um, that they're using the same at the time um, when they get home back from school. This is data that we also found very interesting from um, a service that we provide in Kenya. We run a toll-free helpline number where people can call in at any time of the day or night for counseling. And um, between the periods of, um, this data was collected between the period of uh, May, sorry, yeah, May to October last year during um, the COVID, Kenya, when Kenya was experiencing a huge number in terms of COVID, COVID infections. And as you can see from the study, I mean, from the data that we collected from the people who called in, majority of them, 36.2, were calling in because they needed um, some, some form of counseling um, because of an alcohol problem that they had at the time when they made the call. Um, and and when, you, when you have a look at the second drug that um, was reported was actually cannabis. Um, and this was actually very interesting for us, considering that cannabis is illegal in Kenya, um, but it, it ranked as the second um, drug with which people were calling um, to get help for. Um, we were also fascinated to see other drugs within the list. So people who were calling in to report they were using LSD, um, codeine, and, um, and um, informal alcohol, which is very common um, in, the, in, the, in the global south. So through this helpline, when they call in, um, we're able to give them um, some form of brief interventions over the phone. When they call in, it's free, but also at the same time to follow up on the case, we refer them to the nearest um, treatment and rehabilitation or counseling facility um, within the location where they're calling from. So if they're calling from Western Kenya, they will be referred to the nearest facility from there and will be able to follow up on how they are faring on with regards to the support they will receive eventually. Um, with regards to the burden attributable to SUDs, um, Kenya has recorded an increase of NCD-related mortality the last, the last 10 years. Um, when we look at our health sector now, um, the data that we're receiving from the Ministry of Health is um, NCDs account for 50% of, of morbidity and 55% of mortality within, within the country. And um, the top three killers in Kenya now is number one, infectious diseases, number two, cardiovascular diseases, excuse me, and the third cause of um, mortality in Kenya is actually cancer. And we know the risk factors um, for, for, for the NCDs. And for us, we do acknowledge that alcohol use is one of the key contributing um, factors to this rise of NCDs that we are seeing in the country. Our health system um, was already burdened way before even COVID uh, these NCDs came into the picture with HIV. Um, Kenya has among the highest um, HIV prevalence rates within the region, we had 4%. Um, and way before even COVID struck the world and now with other NCDs, our health system is completely overstretched 
and when we add the burden of alcohol use disorders and other substance use disorders, um, we are not able to carry this, this, this burden. So for us, prevention is a way to go, be it at primary level or secondary level, so that we avert um, those who are already using from developing um, a disorder. And for those who are not started, for them to not start in the first place. Some of the quick interventions that we've been running um, during the COVID-19 period, um, this is informed by various um, conventions, the three drug conventions, the global strategy that has been alluded to earlier, the SAFE initiative, and then we are also in the process of domesticating the UNODC international standards for both prevention and treatment so that they can inform our programs. And as a speaker before me has indicated that all the programs that we're implementing need to be evidence-based. So we've singled out our intervention settings and that is right from the family because it's the most powerful socialization agent for children and young people, um, communities, schools, and, and, and workplaces. So within the COVID-19 period, because of the restrictions um, that were introduced by government on, 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 on people coming together, and in any case, schools in Kenya were closed from March of 2020, and children were at home for between March to December, and they just resumed school in January. We were running a number of um, campaigns or infomercials using different um, settings, that is social media, mainstream media, and just today we launched another campaign um, on back to school under COVID because we realized that children have been at home for nine months. They've just come back and um, we've not debriefed them. I mean, they've gone through a lot at home within these nine months and already in the country, we are starting to experience um, the effects of the same. Within the first two weeks of students resuming school, we are starting to see um, a lot of unrest, schools are being burnt, and it feels like um, these students are imploding. So we've started to reach out to parents, to teachers, to support them to be able to identify what are some of the challenges that these young people are going through and how can you debrief them even as they are coming back to school after the nine months. Of course, we also ran a, a campaign that we are calling Positive um, Parenting Campaign informed by the realization that the, the family is the most powerful socialization agent for children. So we are reaching out to parents, equipping them with parenting skills, um, especially during the COVID-19 period when they were at home, what do they do with their time? Um, we were also reaching out to other policy makers so that they can help us in ensuring that alcohol is not sold within the home environment to protect children from the effects of the same. So this is what I alluded to earlier. This is a press statement that we released um, with regards to the upsurge of, um, of, of, of burnings in schools and student unrest and indiscipline, encouraging all stakeholders to play their role in giving opportunities to children to speak because of the many things that they experienced when they were at home during the, um, the, that period that schools had been closed. Um, I also alluded to the fact that we have a big chunk of civil servants who are using alcohol. We currently have 730 civil, 730,000 civil servants within the government. So now government has ensured that we are in streaming the prevention of alcohol and drug abuse within that intervention setting, which is one of the settings that is recommended within the international standards, the workplace setting. And again, because we cannot meet um, a lot of these trainings are now happening virtually. So this is an example of one of the trainings that we undertook with one of the universities in Nairobi um, for their committee, which will now be mandated to run the campaign within that institution setup. With regards to the provision of counseling and treatment services, um, as I mentioned, we have the toll-free helpline number where Kenyans call between 8 to, 9 to 5 p.m. We have to limit it to 5 p.m. now because of the curfew that we have in the country due to COVID-19. We are also running um, campaigns via social media to, 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 to inform people that um, addiction is a disease. And the stigma that we apportion to people who are suffering from this condition or disease needs not to be there. It's a, it's a disease like any other. If people can get treated and they can get out of it. So this is something that we're also encouraging Kenyans to be able to understand that this is a disease that can be, um, can, someone can get well from. 
Um, we are also mandated, mandated to ensure that the laws that, that are put in place with regards to alcohol are, are, are implemented and implemented well. During the COVID-19 period, we had a serious problem of alcohol being sold um, through online platforms because um, people were not able to access their drink of choice within bars because they had been closed. So we were running a campaign informing um, people who are in the industry that yes, you're still allowed to sell alcohol, but there are laws in the country that, um, that you need to follow. We also saw an upsurge of informal alcohol in the production and use of informal alcohol. And as you can see from one of the photos, um, the policemen were busy now pouring um, some of this in one of the villages in Western Kenya. Um, we also used uh, media platforms to have an honest discussion with Kenyans about online sale of alcohol. As an authority, our position was um, greater restrictions need to be put in place because you cannot confirm the age of the people who are receiving the drink once it's delivered to the home. Um, so if those provisions are put in place, then we can, we can see if that can be licensed within the country. Um, we also engaged a bit of the industry um, to find out from them, how, how, how do we balance, how do we have a balance between the restrictions that government has put, but at the same time, since they want to ensure that their business is still running, um, how do we have that balance and still protect the lives um, of, of, of young people? So we had a few engagements with industry, with other policymakers um, to discuss some of these challenges that you are seeing. In conclusion, what we have learned um, over the last, the last few months during particularly this COVID-19 period is that we need to harness um, digital technologies to support pub the public health response to the substance use problem in our country, right from health promotion, which is a bit of prevention, facilitating brief interventions for people who are not yet at the addiction stage, counseling sessions, the research, and for us, because we are a regulatory agency, providing platforms um, digitally through which Kenyans can report back to us on areas of non-compliance. Um, we also found that young people were particularly appreciative of opportunities to seek counseling through an online platform because it, they, 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 they felt a bit anonymous rather than face-to-face, -face, which is what we were having um, earlier. So they were opening up more. So this is a platform that we definitely intend to enhance um, some more. Thank you. Hope, Christina, I kept within the 10 minutes. Okay, I gave up on the time <laughs> control <laughs> this side event. Uh, but uh, no, thank you very much, Adrian. And, and thank you very much for presenting really uh, the ways how you target different groups. So, so this is also very useful to hear. And uh, then in the end, uh, you have mentioned actually the, uh, you have mentioned the opening up uh, of young people to various, uh, to, to with their problems. Uh, and that takes us actually to Alcohol Change UK and Richard who will now talk about their approach and I believe a very concrete um, initiative they are having that, that is actually connected to where Adrian has stopped. So Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, wherever, wherever time it is where you are. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm Richard Piper from Alcohol Change UK. Um, Alcohol Change UK um, is evidence-based organisation focused on alcohol in the UK. Uh, we undertake research, uh, we do policy, uh, we work on cultural shift, we support the treatment sector, but we also work on behaviour change. And we've heard already from some speakers how behaviour change is hard. What I hope I'm going to do in just a few slides is uh, try to inspire us a little bit <laughs> in relation to behaviour change. Um, by sharing a campaign that some of you may have heard of, um, some of you may, may not have heard of. Um, the campaign is called uh, Dry January. Um, and um, uh, in particular, I want to focus on the digital aspects of the campaign. So Dry January is a very digital campaign. Um, we've already had some great questions about the digital divide for, for people who don't have smartphones. And I don't have an answer to that. That is a great question. But for this presentation, you're going to have to kind of work on the basis that people do are using smartphones. Uh, but I do think that's an important issue. 
I want to talk particularly about the gap between prevention and treatment. We often talk about prevention and treatment, but there's a big group in the middle. We, we often talk about alcohol in binaries, people who are dependent and everyone who's okay. But what we know about alcohol is it's a sliding scale. And there's a big group of people in the middle who need some particular help. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, now then let me move forward. How does this move forward? There we go. Uh, so, um, more people die from alcohol use than all the illegal drugs in the UK. I think you know this, actually, we've covered this. I think some of the speakers have really covered the issues of alcohol, Carl. I think I just want to emphasise that final point. We still have to keep making this point that excessive alcohol use is caused by society, not just by individual choice. That's a really important point because what I'm about to say is actually about individuals. Um, and the reason for that, we as an organisation work for policy change, but we also believe that behaviour change is powerful and that empowerment is an important part of the picture. So I'm going to talk about Dry January, but I'm also going to talk about a mobile application called Try Dry. Try Dry is the name of that application. Dry January is basically uh, run by a not-for-profit. It's a people-led campaign, and it's important to say it's a behaviour change campaign. It's not about fundraising. Now, despite the name, it's not about people going dry forever, um, and it's certainly not just about January. It's actually about long-term change, and it's to help people reset their relationship. There's an official campaign, uh, which we tend to capitalise, DJ, capitalise, Dry January, and people sign up to that, and, and we've, uh, we're engaging 150,000 people across the UK uh, now every year in that. Um, but there's also an unsupported dry January. That's just people who, ha who have a month of alcohol on their own. That's been shown to be really, really less effective. Um, so if I, if I would say one message to take away from my presentation today is if you want to run any campaign like this, try and make an official campaign with support. It's the support package that makes the difference. However, you know, 4 million to 7 million people in the UK are doing a dry January um, unsupported. And, and we kind of see them as a, an, an audience who eventually, hopefully, will come and find the official campaign. How does it work? Well, of course, it's a dry month, um, but key to it is this free package of support. Um, I think we all know that being told information doesn't make a massive difference to us. Um, you know, when I was overweight, I knew I was overweight. It wasn't a problem of knowledge. The problem was about behaviour. And in particular, what, how Dry January works is it's experiential learning. It's learning from your personal experience. Um, and there are four big things that people learn. The first thing that they learn, they break this, a brick of, a brick of, a wall of denial that people have gets broken. The wall of denial gets broken and they realise that controlling their drinking is necessary to them. They realise it's got out of hand. And that's probably the most important step of all, actually. And if people only learn that one thing during a dry January, then they've, they've learned something important, important. But they also learn it's possible um, to be without alcohol. And then they start learning it's desirable to be without alcohol, which is really exciting. And then they start to create a new identity for themselves. Now, the support package is really, really important. And the whole thing is provided free, uh, apart from our book, uh, which um, is about 99p on Amazon, but <laughs> uh, which is about a pound or... or, or or not much more than a dollar or a euro. Um, social media is really important to engage people. There's an, a, a practical daily email which contains essentially coaching messages. So it's, so it's kind of scientific coaching, but wrapped up in a really positive dynamic email. There's our award-winning blog, which contains over 200 individual stories of people who've changed their drinking, many of whom have moderated, many of whom have chosen lifelong sobriety, but a real mix of experience because it's so important that this is relatable, that people can, can feel it's about them. Um, and then our private Facebook group is where the real, and the, and the Try Dry app um, on, on the bottom left and the bottom right are where the real magic happens. That's where the behavior change actually kicks in. People are peer, peer supporting each other in the Facebook group and on the app, they're holding themselves accountable. The, the app, we, we think it's the global leader. Um, it's uh, free. Um, it's so much more than a drinks tracker. Um, I'm sure Christina can make these uh, and Mike can make these slides available, so I'm not going to go through this. Uh, but just to say there's a lot of great stuff in the app. I want to draw attention just to the second bullet point. We don't call it Audit C. <laughs> On the app dashboard, it's called 
what is your drinking risk score? Um, on average, people do that within 20 hours of going into the app. It's entirely optional, um, but they tend to repeat it over time. And critically, as well as the app being an incredible tool for people who use it, it also produces incredible data for us. So we're able to track people's drinking journeys over the long term. And that data is, is, is absolute gold dust. We know that people's, um, the quality of people's recording of data is also much, much higher. So when people are doing self-report questionnaires, we all know the self-report questionnaires on alcohol. Historically, all the research shows they underestimate. The data on actual drinking levels within our app is, is about as accurate as we think people can get because it's a daily record. Essentially, it's a daily diary of people's drinking. The app has now been translated to French and German and we're able to translate to pretty much any language. I think it's really important to have a clear theory of change. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna focus on the middle section here. Um, I've already mentioned who Dry January targets. But essentially people try Dry January as a challenge. So Dry January is a bit like the acquisition tool. It's what gets people in, it's what gets people excited. But actually then they start to experience the support package. They see other people, they read, they learn, um, and of course they find a new tribe. They, they reach a different way of thinking. They feel supported and they feel inspired. So they have those moments of learning. If, for example, you have a drink on the 15th of January and loads of people around you encourage you to treat that as a learning experience, not as a, oh God, I've ruined it, right, forget it. That completely shifts your journey. Um, and then at the end of the month, people set themselves new goals. A common, common one is 50 days. Some people will go for 100 days. Once they succeed on that, and they may not succeed immediately, but they will set, set smaller goals, longer goals. People go through a bit of a journey of going a bit ambitious, and then they bring it down a bit, and then they get they find their right level. They start achieving those goals, and then they start rethinking who they are. And this embeds a new behaviour of no longer engaging in risky drinking. Um, I think it's clearly the case. Um, we've yet to do the, the maths on this, um, but millions and millions of pounds of state resources are being saved because people are not going into treatment. Uh, it's a graph with figures going up. <laughs> that's what, you know what that says. So that, that so it shows that this campaign um, in the last four years has, has um, more than quadrupled um, in, in interest. Um, but it's also really important to say that those figures from the UK, it's also a global campaign. It's an app on, on Play Store or, or on Apple Store. So anyone can download it. This year we had our first participant from the Antarctic. So we're very excited to welcome, welcome her on board. Um, and uh, in total, we have about over 170 countries using it on Try Dry App. We also have the campaign delivered officially in the US, France, Switzerland, and now the Netherlands. And we license that campaign for other countries for them to use. We don't want to come and do it for you. We want other countries to do it the way they want to do it. Um, we've got a few simple rules to check the campaign to be run kind of uh, with good quality. Uh, but we, it's all about individual countries um, owning this and, and making it their own. Um, where we've got a, a long list of countries interested in Dry January 22. And anyone who wants to work with us is welcome to contact me. Um, I've got my details on the final slide. We're particularly keen to work with developing countries and also to learn how we can adapt the campaign to work better in, in other nations. It's a really impactful campaign. The human impact is important. It's been very thoroughly evaluated. We've had university psychologists and researchers. It's one of the most evaluated alcohol interventions um, of, of recent years in the UK. Uh, and the app has also been uh, evaluated and users consistently play a part in keeping it, keeping it changing and improving. First thing to say is that those who do a support of Dry January, the official campaign, 70% of those stay dry. For the people who just try going dry on their own, um, there are half as many people, 36% stay dry. So people are twice as likely to be successful if they do the proper version. And that's why that is so important, because we want to create behaviour change. We want to create long-term success. By the end of the month, this is just by the end of the month itself, um, we've got really high figures of, of success levels. Interestingly, at the beginning of the month of January, most people put weight as the thing they most want to get. But any of you who, who've ever had tried dry month or tried cutting down your drinking will, will know the sugar craving that, that follows. And, and so many people end up um, eating, eating a lot more <laughs> than they would have done otherwise. Um, but nonetheless, people save really significant amounts of money over 45 million pounds worth has been saved just by users of the app and not spent on alcohol and over 4 million units of alcohol so far in just two years. A few of the quotes, people talking about an absolute change in their relationship and feeling empowered 
to choose to drink or not drink. One of the key phrases we, we kind of use is the choice to drink or not drink rather than drinking by default. And drinking by default is so common in the UK. It's just what you do. It's like breathing. It's like waking up in the morning, brushing your teeth and drinking it. It feels like an, a, a part of this essential part of life, but making it an optional part of life is, is really critical. And that's what the campaign starts to create. Um, but of course, the real benefits, waking up, feeling alive. I mean, for someone who's, who's been through this journey myself, I can tell you of all those benefits, the, 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 obviously the self-control is amazing, but the sleep thing, sleeping better is just incredible. And uh, yeah, as someone who was a heavy drinker and, and, and um, it now isn't, I can tell you that that sleeping uh, quality that comes from, from taking control of your drink is just, it's just brilliant um, and, and, and changes all aspects of your life. Of course, I've said it's not about January. So what's happening long term? Well, 97% of people by the end of the month plan to stop drinking or drink less than before. Um, that's a pretty high figure. Uh, but critically, six months later, 67% are, are actually drinking less. So we all know how it's great to have intentions, but people are not just finishing dry January with good intentions. They're finishing dry January with good intentions and a packet of experienced learning that they can then put into practice. So they stand a far much, uh, far better chance of success. 1% um, of people plan to drink more. <laughs> we don't know what's happening with those guys. Um, this is um, from the official evaluations. This is the, uh, 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 those of you may know that WEM, WBS is a well-being measure. So this is a common well-being measure. Um, the dotted line shows the general population of the UK. So going into dry January, the people who do a dry January have lower well-being than the, than the average population. Um, not by much, but they have lower well-being. By the end of January, after one month, it's way higher than the general population their well-being. But what's critical is after six months, that's the, the third point on this chart on, on the right, um, it's still much higher. And, and those of you who know this is a scale out of five, and we're talking about global ad, averages here or, or national averages. So actually a jump from three point, 3.5 to 3.65 is a really significant, statistically significant um, shift in well-being for, for people who've done a dry January. Uh, and then secondly, this is about drinking. And as you'd expect, going into January, at the beginning, uh, the audit C score of people who do a dry January is, is over eight. So a really high audit C score. Audit C, for those of you that don't know, is a, three, a simple three question uh, uh, quiz about how, how much people drink, how often they drink and how often they drink excessively. With the general population, it's just over, just under six. Uh, six months later, um, that, that population of heavy drinkers um, is, is not far off the general population. Um, and many of them will actually be below it. But on average, they've taken control of their drinking and got pretty close. And that trend line continues. After 12 months, although it does start to curve, it more or less matches the general population. So what we're doing, people, is we're turning heavy drinkers, risky drinkers, who are on their way to alcohol dependence, we're turning them around or helping them turn themselves around. It's important that we say that they're taking credit for this. Uh, we have huge media impact, um, um, not just in the UK, but also worldwide, uh, which keeps us busy. And that also allows us to talk about alcohol and culture, which is so important. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of the best known campaigns in the UK. It's better known than Extinction Rebellion, Me Too. It's nearly as popular as the Poppy Appeal, which has been going for 60 years. Um, so a really well-known campaign. Uh, and it has huge social media engagement. We trend on Twitter pretty much every year in the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we've started getting celebrity endorsement for it as well. And finally, I think it's really important to say it's a campaign that engages everybody. Our oldest participant this year was 89 years old. Um, we have uh, uh, predominantly, uh, it's fantastic at engaging women. Um, our campaign materials are really accessible to, uh, to, to, to those who have less money uh, for the poorer parts of the population as well. Um, this is not just about a, kind of a, a white middle-class woman. Uh, we've got figures this year um, that seeing uh, ethnic diversity really coming through strongly. Uh, we've done a lot of work on that this year as a result of um, uh, our, our response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and we've, we've changed the way the campaign works and we've, we're seeing a big growth in particularly some communities in the UK that don't like to talk about alcohol. Um, dry January is really an opportunity. People may do it privately, but they're still doing it. 
And because they're doing it, they're doing it with us. Um, they're getting those benefits and allowing themselves to, to make a big difference in their lives. Um, and then just in conclusion, and I know I've moved pretty fast through this, and apologies if I'm talking too fast for some of you. Um, uh, basically, globally, dry January and dry dry could save millions of lives, improve tens of millions. We know about the child abuse, domestic violence, road traffic accidents, all the other harms you've already heard about, and I'm sure many of you know about. Um, it empowers women and men to take back control and people who don't fit um, gender binaries. It will save billions of pounds that could be spent on specialist treatment services or later treatment. But also a really exciting opportunity here is this creates a digital movement of campaigners who drive social change. Uh, we don't stop when people have got control of their drinking. We don't stop the journey. We actually start with people then starting a new journey of becoming campaigners, becoming activists. And one of the things the UK just doesn't have, I don't know if you have it in other countries, I'd love to hear about it. But in the UK, we don't have a group of activists who care about alcohol harm. It's often left to specialists like us. But we're starting to see now, we're up to now over 12,000 uh, activists. Uh, and we're getting MPs saying, we've never heard um, from people about alcohol before. We're having people talking to us about alcohol. It's changing our thinking. And that's how we change policy. So from behaviour change, we can shift culture, and from culture, we can shift policy. So all of our work links together. So you're very welcome to get in touch. I'd love to hear from anybody who's, who's, who's with, us, with us this evening. Uh, and of course, looking forward to having a look at the questions that may have popped up while I've been concentrating on speaking. So thank you so much again, uh, Mavendi, Christina, and Mike for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, would love to hear from anybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for, first of all, for the work that you guys are doing in the UK, because as you wrote there, you are changing and saving lives, and this is just amazing, and it's wonderful to see it growing, so I understand that now under, after 2021, January, now we were 150,000 uh, um, users of the, of the app, and last year it was 100,000, if I understand correctly, and so that was also a huge increase, so this is just amazing. Uh, thank you for that. And also, I believe the people who are still uh, here and are listening, they could hear you that you are there to also assist and help them uh, to introduce the app also elsewhere, because it could have a huge reach. So this is just amazing, uh, as I said. And um, I, will, I will now guys share with you a few slides to wrap this up. Uh, and then if, if you have time to still stay, uh, we could because there are some good questions and some some comments uh, also so we could still continue uh, at least a little bit um, this is the problem with uh, interesting things that you don't want to interrupt that and uh, you want to let people finish so that's what I have done <laughs> and now we are a bit late so but like if I just wrap it up like in the beginning I was talking then about social development because this is the the commission that is actually focused on that and this side event is about that and it's uh, even though some participants were also asking about how to deal with uh, people who do not have access to the digital environment like now we are really focused in this side event on the on the effect of different digital technologies to improve people's lives uh, and we have then been talking about the investment and also about removing barriers uh, and i think that the digital Technologies are actually, as we could hear from several of you, the, the presenters, they actually, the anonymity of them actually uh, also helps people to start reflecting on the situation and uh, then also enables them uh, some behavioral change if, of course, good initiatives are uh, taken. And here I just want to show you that like uh, nowadays, and also because, because of uh, COVID-19, some groups that we should actually uh, look at because the social development really has to be about all the groups, uh, uh, whether it's women, men, uh, children, LGBTQI community, older people. Uh, but what we have noticed during this uh, pandemic is that these uh, groups of people are actually doing worse when it comes to alcohol and uh, then consequently their well-being. So here are just a few examples of different um, uh, articles uh, f f about different groups of people. So here we have LGBTQI, then we have older people uh, having um, more problems with alcohol, then we have several uh, 
uh, or many times actually mentioned how women are now uh, doing worse beca because of uh, COVID and alcohol. And then we also have uh, young people uh, here, this uh, study from Canada, some Canadian, Canadian students are, uh, their, their life and their, their well-being is actually getting worse now. And the problem is that it's really, the governments have not managed to address it. And uh, that's, that's the problem, that it's not, uh, as uh, also I think Maristella in the beginning uh, mentioned that the, the political will and the commitment is missing and also just like the understanding of the, uh, of the issue. Uh, but then we also have the industry practices that I really wanted to touch upon. Uh, as we mentioned, like this is, this is a question of policies. This is a question of behavioral change. This is definitely not a question of responsibility of one single person or like it's never just the individual problem. Uh, and then we are having also a huge industry playing in. Uh, and this is the documentation from Australia, how the industry was actually behaving during COVID, uh, actually supporting and fueling uh, the alcohol problem. So they were promoting alcohol use uh, as the way to catch up uh, socially online. So have a Zoom meeting and have some, uh, some drink. Uh, then they were encouraging alcohol consumption as a way to cope with boredom, stress and anxiety. There were really commercials or there still are uh, advertisements uh, talking about these issues and support solving it, solving it with, with alcohol. Uh, then they, the, there was an increase in exposure to, to alcohol advertisements and social media. So uh, our colleagues from FAIR have made a study and understood that every 35 seconds people were actually exposed to some ad. And uh, this is, this we could see also before, but now it's, uh, now it even increased the uh, uh, healthy words uh, connected to alcohol and uh, like alcohol is organic and it's uh, ecological and uh, healthy and so that's uh, encouraging people in alcohol use and I think this also needs to be uh, considered and then we are coming back to what again Maristella presented in her presentation uh, and when talking about safer and that how important it is also to protect from the interference of alcohol industry and monitor uh, the practices and expose them. And then luckily there are these initiatives like uh, we could hear uh, Richard talk about dry January uh, then or try dry, which is actually really not only about dry January. Uh, then we were supposed to have Holly here who would be talking about um, her online community really tailor-made uh, to for, for, um, for people to reduce or really quit using alcohol. And then we know also that we have uh, something similar and this is all digital. So this is uh, also amazing, like how, how, much, how much help people are getting thanks to these technologies. Uh, Hello Sunday morning in Australia. And then we, have, then we know also of Soberistas that was originally one simple blog. And actually it's very similar to with, with all these uh, digital supports like it was it was started by people who in the beginning just started writing a blog sharing their experiences and then it grew into communities and now uh, many people are benefiting from that so i wanted to mention it but still we have these great communities but we, we, we are really not reaching everyone and uh, and we could see the headlines uh, not enough people are uh, still getting help. And I think that it's because we are also really missing the policies and that are creating then this environment that would help to reduce the alcohol use. Um, so this would be my very fast wrap up. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you from my side uh, for participating and being here with us and uh, speaking, but now I would I would, I'm not closing the conversation yet because I really would like to attend to some questions from, from people in the questions and answers, but also uh, in, the, in the chat. And I have seen that some of you have already uh, also replied, which is really great. Uh, I would already, I would ask the first question that was there because there, and I would ask Maristella to answer most probably that uh, you are the best 
for this one, even though you can actually combine the, or cooperate with Elizabeth on this, because the question is, is the legalization and regulation of alcohol the reason it's separated from other harmful drugs? Uh, I think so. Uh, it is uh, not part of the UN conventions. Uh, tobacco uh, was successful in uh, adopting or uh, framework convention tobacco control, leaving alcohol as the only substance that doesn't have any regulatory uh, framework uh, at global level. And uh, it is very difficult, but there is a growing number of uh, experts, member state scientists, advocates that um, don't see any other way uh, than having uh, such uh, convention or, or something that will be binding and uh, especially because alcohol is a global commodity and uh, uh, marketing and access and if and social media uh, make it very difficult uh, to control at national level. Thank you, Marta. Yes, Beth. The only thing that I would add, I 100% agree. Um, the only thing that I would add is that I do think that the issues related to stigma also silo the funding as well as the um, different ways in which we talk about the differences between drugs and alcohol. I mean, I, I, I don't often say this, but maybe you're catching me at, a, at the end of my day, but you know, alcohol sits at WHO which is, uh, has a different feel than s drugs that sit in an organization that has a focus on, um, uh, you know, the, the supply side reduction. So, uh, you know, until we make that shift, and I think that uh, my friend in Nigeria said it very well, until we make that shift where we're talking about health and we're talking about health disorders for all substances, I think we will still see those silos. And it's mostly from my perspective about stigma. Yeah, thank you very much for this answer. Let's move. Uh, we had a question to, um, to Adrian and that came from Eze from Nigeria. And there he asked uh, whether you have, uh, how did you deal with the industry uh, or how do you do that? Can you describe how your sessions with alcohol industry operatives went? Would you describe it as positive or productive? Please unmute. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you for the question, Eza. Our focus has been on um, implementing the WHO recommendations on modifying the drinking environment. Um, especially around this season um, with regards to the pandemic. So we, we work with the, what we have in our country is that the industry has set up what we call bar owners associations. So we, we train the bartenders to be able to identify someone who's already inebriated because our laws provide that you cannot sell to someone who has already um, surpassed a certain level of inebriation. And then if they are if they're driving, it's advisable that you help them to get a cab. Then with regards to modifying other sec sections of the drinking environment, we talk to them about need to ensure lighting um, within, within the drinking environment um, to have different um, washrooms for ladies and gents, because we know the kind of violence that um, at times is, is meted um, within the, the, the drinking environments, particularly towards women. And then we also encourage them to use um, plastic, um, plastic, um, what do you call them, cups, as opposed to glass, to glass, uh, to glasses, because again, when there's violence, um, those same glasses are the ones that are used um, when they throw, throw at each other. So usually that is our, our, our engagement. We focus on what is in the law and also to encourage them to modify um, the places within which they are serving um, their clients. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That sounds very much like harm reduction, right? That you are actually dealing with. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, for that. And then we would go to, unless 
really the panelists can just uh, wave at me if you, if you want to react uh, or talk because it shouldn't be just question and answer. So feel free, uh, I'm watching you. <laughs> and then uh, I am, uh, we are having here also question, many, many comments to you, uh, Richard, and I believe you are reading them, the interest about the dry January. And then Florence has asked also, but maybe it has been already answered, about whether you cooperate with other initiatives like One Year No Beer, for example, whether there is some connection. But maybe you have answered that I, and I missed that. Yeah, no, you have already answered. So then I don't actually see any questions to you because you were too fast in answering. Uh, but what I can say and what I can read also here in the chat that Movendi International is in touch with you also when it comes to especially our members that are asking here that we are discussing whether we could do something so we could also help the help to spread the, the app. Um, yes, yes, Elizabeth, go ahead. I was going to give Richard the floor, but I just wanted to say in my presentation, I didn't focus a lot on the evaluation piece. So I really appreciated that um, Richard followed up with some information about numbers and data. Um, and I typically will start my presentation by saying, uh, you know, I'm a prevention person and that I believe that campaigns don't work. And I forgot to say that this time because I really do believe that um, that traditional media campaign where we think we will change the behavior is less likely to work. But the focus of the way that we're rolling out the listen first materials we actually will work with you to determine how do you want to use them how can you collect data to show that and we discourage people from saying that it will actually change a person's behavior or stop a certain percentage of people from using drugs so it's nice to see richard's um you know corresponding kind of approach because he's he has data to actually show some of that behavior change so we just look at it from uh, individual perspective. So thank you. That's a really thank good you. point, actually, if I might just come in here, Christina, I think the, the word campaign gets in the way of many things because it uses it's used in so many ways. Um, obviously, I don't know if this is common in any in other international contexts, but we often talk about campaigns as well as in terms of fundraising campaigns. And actually, when I took over Dry January, it was really confused and a confused place. It was sort of a fundraising campaign. It was also sort of a media campaign. But at the heart of it was an amazing behaviour change campaign. And what we did was we inverted that logic and we put the behaviour change first and foremost. We, we then gave ourselves a really tough lesson in behaviour change science, behaviour change evidence, and, and made, it, made it what we would want it to be if we were going to change anyone's behaviour um, with that focus on experiential learning. We then kept the cultural shift, the media stuff in there. Um, so um, the, the media is really powerful for us. Um, for some reason, they talk about it every year. <laughs> um, I, you know, even when there's a uh, you know a bad news happening elsewhere in the world, which they clearly there was at the beginning of January. Um, and when the UK went into a lockdown, a big lockdown on the fourth of January, everybody said, "Oh, that's dry January cancelled." And what they really meant is, "That's my hopes for the new year cancelled." That's all the good things we thought we were looking forward to for 21 cancelled. So dry January actually becomes a media trope. And what we saw was a massive increase um, in, in uptake on the 4th, 5th and 6th of January. So it really proves there's no such thing as bad media, you know. Or uh, the people voted with their, with their smartphones and said, dry January, what's that? Oh God, there's an official campaign, I'm gonna sign up. So um, that media campaign is really, really valuable. And at the beginning of January, I think it's important to say we focus very much on get the app, do the campaign properly, don't just do it on your own. We don't tell people to do Joy January, they're already doing it, 7 million people are doing it. We tell them to do it properly, join the campaign, join the team, These are, this is the language we use. But then as the month goes on, we end up having fantastic opportunities to talk about the role of alcohol in society. Um, so the conversation moves away from the behaviour change piece into that cultural shift piece. Um, in fact, um, you know, it, it rolls right on into, into, um, into February and March. Um, I'm doing media on, on Saturday morning uh, on, on national radio talking about um, uh, dry January, where next? It's the 15th of February. It's, it's two weeks at the end of it, but they, they still want to talk about it. Um, and then um, we have a very big programme called Sober Spring. And Sober Spring launches um, in, you know, it starts at the, this is very much a, a Northern Hemisphere thing. 
uh, at spring equinox, which for us is twenty uh, first of March, and runs to the summer solstice, uh, which is the twenty first of June. It's not a pagan festival, just to reassure any of you, um, but it is ninety two days, and that ninety two days of sobriety is perfect for people who've had a tricky, a tricky February trying to keep it up, really lost it in the beginning of March, and then they take on that longer term campaign. That is nothing to do with media. Nobody hears about it. Nobody in the world knows about it. But once we've got people in through dry January, it's that acquisition process. So we acquire people through a kind of fun campaign that's not really very challenging. But actually, once people come on board and come in with their team, realise they've got a bit of a challenge, but realise they can solve this problem with other people around them, inspired by other people's stories. So our alumni are from 2018, 2019, 2020 stay part of the campaign, stay part of the group. So everyone's getting this kind of passing forward, this kind of amazing learning they've developed. Um, you know, kind of nobody goes through an experience that someone else, else hasn't already been through before. Mm-hmm. And then once they're in the tribe, then we then we move them on to 100 day challenges, sober springs or whatever. So mm-hmm. it's important to say, I believe that behavior change can happen. Uh, it's hard work, it's hard work, mm-hmm. but I think with the right campaigns, it's really possible. Yeah, uh, thank you, Richard. And I think what this, what is also great what you have mentioned in the, uh, earlier is that the, there are activists actually coming out of this campaign and they are supporting the policies and i think this is this is what because i w- i believe that the policies are actually very very important and we could hear that that's the population level there that's where we can actually catch people <laughs> uh, and make some make some kind of change uh, um, so so that's great that this is actually uh, growing support uh, this kind of application. Uh, we are really now over time. And then also I can see that people are dropping out slowly but surely. So I would just uh, like to make a very little round uh, that every one of you would maybe summarize with one, two sentences uh, in relation to the topic, like what what is it that you would like to, how would you conclude this uh, side event, please? And we, we could, can I start with Maristella? Can we go as we have started in the same order, please? Okay, I'll be short. I really liked your presentation too, uh, Richard, and I was thinking uh, fit Latin America too. So I'm gonna follow up. Uh, but uh, I think we need to look at all the challenges that we faced last year. Uh, and is still facing as opportunities uh, for uh, new ways of engaging people, uh, advocates, and uh, ways of reaching out for services, for advocacy, for prevention. Thank you you. very much. Beth. Great. I, I agree. I absolutely think that this has, has really broadened our perspective on how we reach out to people, how we can engage people, all of that. But I do I have a little bit of caution because I have an education background. I think that we it's going to catch up to us. It's nice right now because we're experiencing that wave of, wow, I get more people can get the message. But I think that the reality of we need to be very focused. We need to be very clear what it is we're attempting to do and then as we've shared you know find ways to measure that because just getting a hundred people in a webinar for two hours is not necessarily an effective strategy it may just be a nice thing to write in a report so um, I I think that we have this uh, to carry with us forward and I think it's a great experience and we will come out ahead in the end thank you thank you again for the opportunity to speak thank you so much and Adrian, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. I, I also like to echo the what Elizabeth and Marisela have talked about. Um, let's use the um, tragedy that we experienced last year to inform um, new interventions that we can we can now implement within uh, both prevention, treatment, and for us the regulatory space. For Elizabeth, I'm looking forward to see where digital technologies will, find, if they will find a home within the third edition of the of the drug use prevention standards, because I know within the second edition that that was not mentioned. But now that we are living in what we are calling the new normal, um, once the, <laughs> once the 
um, these interventions have been evaluated and um, the levels of efficacy are beyond reproach, then I'm sure they will find a home within, within the standards. And thank you, Movendi, for putting together the meeting. Thank you, Adrian. Richard? Well, thank you. I've, I've learned so much from the other speakers as well. Really, um, I think that these sorts of events are always so valuable. So, so um, I always feel like I've learned a lot more than I, I, I've offered. So, so thank you um, to the other speakers as, as well. And, and for all the wonderful people who've been um, sending such interesting ideas uh, and questions in the chat. So, so thank you just, I think, for being part of something all together. For me, that's what so much of this is about. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much also to you and from my side and also to all the participants. Um, respect to everyone who is uh, here now up very late. Uh, thank you. We will be in touch in some way or we will come uh, with some new uh, event, webinar or side event in the future. So please uh, stay tuned. Thank you and a good night or good uh, rest of the day to everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.